This is the Up Level Dairy Podcast for dairy farm owners, managers, and advisors who are committed to profitability, sustainability, and excellence. My name is Peggy Coffeen, and it's my mission to bring you the conversations that will up level your skill set and your mindset so you can be a top performer in the dairy business. Culture, it's how your employees feel in the pit of their stomach on Sunday night about coming to work for you on Monday morning. How do you want them to feel when they show up for their milking shift? Are they smiling and happy to be there or are they just punching the clock and putting in their time? And if you could improve the culture, what would be possible for you? Hitting your goals for milk quality, milking more cows per hour, or how about just less stress as the owner or manager of a dairy? Well, a few months back, I took a tour group out to visit my friends, the Spears family at Shiloh Dairy in Brilliant, Wisconsin, and the culture was something that you could see and feel. In fact, there was a party going on in the parlor. Milkers were smiling and striking a pose for pictures. These employees were happy to be there. They were having fun. And so I just had to sit down with the owner and manager of this dairy, our friend Travis Spears, to find out how he was making this happen, all while growing from 2,400 to 2,900 cows and transitioning in his own role, from being with the cows every day to now spending more time in the business and operations management chair as his father, Gordon, steps back from the day-to-day operations and decisions. Now, Travis will be the first to say culture at Shiloh Dairy is constantly evolving and not every day is a party in the parlor, but there are a few high-impact actions that are leading to results like low turnover and a waiting list to work at Shiloh Dairy. Is that what you want too? What are these high impact actions? Well, that's what we're about to find out on this Up Level Dairy podcast, part of the High Performance Mindset series powered by NEDAP. NEDAP is future-proofing dairy farms by revolutionizing cow-side care through technologies and activity monitoring, cow locating, milk metering, and identification. Stick around all the way to the end for the NEDAP Power Play to learn about improving accuracy of identity identification and data collection with Ron Daly, Meetup Technical Support Manager. Travis says creating a winning culture starts with a vision, a clear picture for the daily experience and interactions at Shiloh Dairy. So when we talk culture, we're also talking about the picture. Like we, all, we always talk about either the 30-foot view, 30,000-foot view, 20,000-foot view, you know, being an artist and painting a picture. And more recently, we denoted, you know, we're, we're painting the same picture, but we have different shades of the color that we would like to use. So instead of using a dark blue, we're using a light blue. So it doesn't look quite right, but it's on the right path of what we need to be doing. And then the process then becomes, how do we get that view? How do we get that color readjusted so that it matches what the goal should be from both up high and as an artist painting that picture? The picture for the culture Travis and his family strive to create at Shiloh looks like this. Well, that's uh, everybody plays nicely together, gets, follows instructions, communicates clearly, understands kind of what the end goal is and how we're going to get there. And we have good constructive conversations and dialogue, not just these one-way discussions where it's one person's talking and the other one listens and assumptions are made, but challenging each other and having having that healthy conflict instead of just the continual one-way banter, if you will, of this is how we're going to do it. And that's the vision that, you know, myself and dad kind of look for is how does this, how are all the pieces in this thing coming together to create this vision and then challenging everybody else at the different levels underneath on as they start to focus in on their 10,000 foot view of what they need to do or the 500 foot view of what they need to do. How can we continue to keep that detail all As Travis will say, not every day is a party in the parlor like my last visit to Shiloh. Rather, culture is an ongoing, behind-the-scenes, intentional effort. On tour day, all anyone sees is the results of all the work, but don't really see what's going on behind that has created what we've got. The eternal, continual internal battles that we go through to keep what we have 
go away. And this is especially true during these past few years of growth and transition, both for the dairy and for Travis's role as an owner and manager. What we've got going on here is, you know, as dad is pulling back, re- not in necessarily retirement mode, but in relaxation mode and not wanting to deal with some of the stresses and is far enough removed from some of the activities that he's not quite in the know anymore. And as I continue to step into some of his roles, you know, I need to let go of some stuff as well. And so we're, we're just seeing this cosmic shift seemingly every year as everyone takes a step and as we learn who can take the step with us, we make changes. And so that's where it, it doesn't look the same from one year to the next or two years to the next two years. As we grow and understand what's going on, who can function well with who, and figure that piece of the puzzle out. And with each step of this growth and transition comes change. You know, we've got a lot of structural changes going on in kind of management, leadership, ownership. And this has been a progressive thing for the last 18 years, where every two years, it seems like we have a different structure kind of playing out, trying to be figured out. And about the time we get close, then it's time to change it again and move on. And I think what where we're headed now is because we're still small enough, we can get away with one person leading the production side of things. And that that's the milking center, the maternity center, the baby cabs, the heifers, one person observing all of that. And maybe we've got, you know, a shift supervisor on the parlor side and, you know, a more dedicated person in some of the other teams that we go and talk to and they are the ones that pass on the information to the rest of the team. Um, We find that you start throwing around leader and manager too much to people, especially when they've been here a long time. They might understand and know the systems and procedures, but they're not the right person to have the leader tag to them. Finding that right person to be a leader has been one of the high impact actions that's positively impacted Shiloh Dairy's culture. We've got a strong culture and happy growing workforce in the milking center. That's all stemmed from the fact that we've got a a good person in charge of that area right now who comes with a heavy hand but an encouraging and and congratulating hand. At the same time, she's quick to say can create job, but also quick to say knock it off and creating some structure where they know this is exactly where I can work. These are my boundaries. These are my walls. The the expectations are set. And as long as we run within those expectations, life is good. And if they lapse or don't pay attention and get called back, they don't take offense to it either because they have that encouraging hand with them along the way. And that's brought the biggest change in there. And she's working with our main Hertz person very, very closely. And that relationship has grown immensely, which has then affected the rest of the Hurt team as well and made that a happier working place. Because again, everybody out there knows here's what needs done today. And it's very clear about what the expectations are. Danielle, a longtime team member at Shiloh Dairy, provides that encouragement, clear expectations, and when needed, correction and redirection. Moving her into a role with more responsibility over the teams has been a positive move, and Travis has prioritized maintaining the positive culture by exercising patience and filling her previous role. I think at this point, what's helping us is we're taking a step back and not forcing it. You know, we're we're in the process of looking for you know, someone to help replace Danielle as she made her position change six months ago. But again, we want to make sure we get the, we don't want to wait too long. We don't want to rush into things either. And we're still learning what this role is of hers, what my role is, what, how that interacts with the herdsman, and what's that going to look like in three months as we continue to make shifts and changes. And we're kind of stuck in that spot right now. We need to break through and make it happen. But I think what's allowed us to do that is having that strong personality, that strong hand who truly loves the people as well, as much as the animals and treats both equally. Bring and because of for the cow bring the encouragement hand because of the cow. I think that's really brought the team together. 
After all, keeping the cows at the center has always been a core value and foundation for the culture at Shiloh Dairy. And as the dairy has grown, people share that top priority too. Dad's been preaching that for 40 years, and I've been preaching it now for 10, 15 years that, you no, know, we're here for the cow first. We make sure she's comfortable, happy, and healthy, and then we start looking at the people. But again, people has to be not last, but they also need to be probably tight in first place. It's treated the same. And having that common goal of a respectful workplace that creates the environment in which the cows can thrive and the people can thrive. It comes down to treating them like humans. You know, treat each person like they're your brother, uncle, nephew, son, daughter, whatever the age relationship might be. You know, treat everyone like humans and provide the level of respect back and forth that you would expect to attain from them as well. So what does it take to create a workplace culture of respect? The high impact action here, as Travis describes, is conversation and demonstration every single day. It's a lot of team meetings and, and stressing respect, 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 respect. And when you get respect from your coworkers, then as a team, you can be a cohesive unit that then creates the respect needed towards the other teams, towards the animals, towards whoever is in, in the farm, working on the farm. That transfers into each area. And so it's a big, big push and talk on respect, what it means, how to show it, and how to demonstrate it. It takes a lot of conversations. <laughs> it takes a lot of repetition. And at times, maintaining that culture of respect requires correction and redirection. It's not a one and done thing. And sometimes it requires the heavy hand in an individual. In And when I say heavy hand, it's not like a hard reprimand or, you know, some disciplinary action. It's a simply a sit down and say, look, these actions are unacceptable. It's not showing respect to yourself. It's not showing respect to your coworkers. It's not showing respect to anyone. Please understand that next time, don't do it. Go down this path instead. What scenario is. And one scenario in particular sticks out in Travis's mind of how a hard conversation resulted in a positive outcome for a team member and the team culture. Probably the one that Danielle's most proud of is our one of our supervisors was struggling and there was a, a mental shift in him. And we had we sat him down and discussed all this and went through it and kind of weighed out the options and said, Here are here they are. Either you're part of this thing and pushing for the goal or you're not. And something shifted in you, we're not sure what, but the choice is yours. And how are you going to respond to it? And he came out with guns a blazing the next day and has been doing so much better. Still has his moments, but we all do. We're all human. We all have little slip ups. But he, he came out a different person from that meeting with some renewed confidence in himself from us. And he, he's been shining. And that leads to the third high impact action for creating a winning culture, clear communication. We really have to work on our communication. And I don't care who you are, what nationality, what position you're in. Communication is always an issue. Whether it's person to person, sometimes even speaking the same language, they don't understand what's being talked about. And so how can we create that clarity of communication so that everyone understands what the expectations are from that conversation, possible for what part of that conversation. And so I, I need to spend a little more time on that and stop the, I was, I told this person, I didn't hear anything about that. I told them this, like, well, I heard this and how can we clean that up and take away the confusion and take away the half hour conversations that we have around cleaning up each of those misunderstandings or lack of understandings really make it clear that, no, we talked about this. It says right here, this is what was discussed. This is who was going to do what. And whether it's through a text message or verbal or something written now, there needs to be a trail of it. Or you can come back to, this is what was said. Where was the misunderstanding? One method for taking away confusion and clarifying team communication that Travis is getting ready to implement with his team is a program called Slack, a direct messaging app. 
He hopes using this app as a dedicated business communications channel will allow him to keep a pulse on team conversations, to cut down on text messages, and for keeping a communication record as well. So I want to try a program called Slack. Yep, Slack. And just create, if I got to create 50 different groups or chats on it that I'm involved in, whether it's my direct involvement or simply my observation of the involvement of what's being talked about, so I can see exactly who's saying what and when and track those conversations. I like Slack more so for the fact that it's not their normal text messaging app and it's solely centered around the business. You know, if they want to talk personal, it's offline. It's on a different platform. But when we're talking business, it is here. Business talk is done on this. And whether it's a verbal communication that we then text to each other in the group. Another high impact action for establishing clear communication has been putting in place standing mandatory weekly management meetings. We try and have twice a week management style meetings where four or five of the key players of the farm get together, talk about what happened last week, what what do we need to focus in on coming into the week. And that's at noon Friday. And then Monday morning, we sit down and, all right, what's the plan for this week? Who has what going on, when and where, special activities, things of interest that need looked at or taken care of so we can you know, make sure we're all working with purpose. And it's the last two because of manure here, people on vacation or time off and walking around with family or you know, a couple of excuses that we need to, to some degree not worry about and just meet. So we've tried for a number of years to have at least a once a week meeting, but it always seemed, well, I can't do that time. I can do this time. I can do this time, but not that time. Well, not today because, and not tomorrow because, and finally we just said, enough of this. Everyone's going to make time at this time on Monday and this time on Friday. Be there, be square. And if we try and manage six people's schedules and meet when it's convenient for each of us, it'll never happen. I'll end up having six individual meetings twice a week with everybody. (laughs) and no one knows what's happening. Clear communication also comes in the form of signage. If you take a walk around Shiloh Dairy, you will notice signs designating the proper place for things like skid steer forks and payloader buckets. I think more for us what that creates is there's a place for everything and everything in its place. And we still spend more than enough time jumping a skid steer and where'd my forks go? Jumping the payloader. Where's the bucket I'm looking? And it has helped alleviate a lot of that, but there's still improvement to be done. But it it does set the expectation that when you're done with something, don't just drop it anywhere and go do your work. No, take it back, set it back where someone else who might need it in five minutes can actually find it. Not spend 20 minutes walking around, calling on the radio, hey, 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 where's this, where's this, where's this? No, it's in its spot. It's being used. It's being used. It's out. It's gone. But when it's done, put it back. It does, but you got to still be very strict on it. And you see a piece of equipment out of place, you got you have to address it and not just allow it to linger because it will always linger. And then it's not one piece, it's two, and then it's four. And then you might as well not even have the signs or the protocols for that anymore. When it comes to creating a culture of engaged team members through growth, change, and transition, the high-impact actions of putting the right people in the right places, modeling respect and clear communications have been fundamental. And there's one more powerful move that has helped not only keep that culture thriving, but allowed Travis to transition in his role of managing the business and operations. And it's this, let your leaders lead. Where I'm at in my position now is I'm I'm not the one running a lot of these meetings anymore. I'm sitting in the back corner observing and showing my solidarity with the person who is talking, who is leading the meeting. It's not my meeting. It's their meeting. I'm here to observe and listen, or I'm not even in the room for some of them because it's not my thing. I know what's being taught. I understand it. I get it. I don't need to be in there hiding behind or standing over the instructor's shoulders. That's not my position anymore. And so I've removed myself from those or positioned myself as a supportive figure and will interject as needed on encouragement or corrective action. And I think now when I 
push on either one of those behind the person I'm sitting behind, then it really pushes and encourages either side. So when we both came out and said, we believe in you, none of our conversations have been, you can't do it. Our conversations have been, what has changed? And we need you to refocus and come back as you were three weeks ago. We believe that in you and we believe you can accomplish great things, but you need to be on this path, not this path. And so with both of those encouragements, there was a lot of push. I see myself and my influence being more done that way, as in a secondary push behind whoever's running or leading the discussion. This intentional focus on high-impact actions to create and maintain a winning culture have enabled Travis to transition into new responsibilities at Shiloh Dairy. Yeah, so I used to do a lot of breeding. I don't do a lot of that anymore. I used to do a lot more cow work, and I'm down to essentially one day a week total of cow work, and a lot of that's standing in front with the vet and following through and talking, conversing with him. And after that, it's down to managing the expectations of everybody else, trying to keep teams together and talking with vendors and suppliers and everybody inside on the team to make sure that we're getting the best we can. So in summary, as Travis says, not every day is a party in the parlor, but culture is a constant intentional cultivation at Shiloh Dairy. And the high impact actions that lead to low turnover and a high performing team include number one, getting the right people in the right roles through growth and transition. Number two, modeling respect from the top down. Number three, clear communication, including standing management team meetings, using an app like Slack for group communication, signage for setting expectations of where equipment and tools should be returned to after use. And finally, number four, when you have a leader that you promote, let them lead. When someone is promoted, allow them to take ownership in their role, make decisions, and back them up. And that has helped Shiloh Dairy carry on a winning culture through growth and transition. This episode is part of the High Performance Mindset Series powered by NEDAP. And joining us today on the NEDAP Power Play is Ron Daly, a technical support manager for NEDAP. Ron is the whiz at making technology around a milking system work. Hailing from Wisconsin, it's only natural that he's logged over 25 years in the dairy industry, being dedicated to milking equipment and precision dairy solutions. Let's tap into his expertise today on our Power Play. So the first question that I have for you today is we're going to talk a little bit about data. So just first off, define from a dairy perspective, what is accurate data collection and how does that really relate to accurate identification around the dairy? Yeah, data collection is a, is a very key topic. It's one of those basic conversation pieces um, that everybody wants to gather all this data and information, but nobody really necessarily wants to dive into the accuracy of that data. But as our dairy farms are growing in size and the number of cows per per unit of labor are, are growing, the accurate data and the numbers that you're looking at on paper actually do mean something. And, you know, that data should be, you know, very accurate and the integrity of the results, you know, should be proven or checked. Yeah. So, uh, so just speaking more into the importance of accurate data, what is the, the power that the producer has in their hand, not just with data? but with accurate data. Obviously it's, it's a tool to collect information remotely and to create baselines for animals. So you can basically manage, you know, large groups of animals uh, with smaller numbers of people. Um, so you're not doing physical observations anymore. You're doing uh, number crunching on a spreadsheet. You're doing group analytics with data that's being collected. And if we're, you know, putting a sensor on a cow, we definitely want to make sure that the data that we're looking at is for the cow that we want it to be assigned to, not some other herd mate that's not performing. Yeah. And so what you just referenced there, Ron, was collecting data when we put monitors on cows. But realistically, let's back up to the point of birth and the importance of identifying animals properly as soon as they hit the ground. Speak to that in this bigger picture of accurate data collection. Yeah, in the recent years, it comes back to a huge topic of traceability. So, you know, basically, if you can trace the the product that you're buying in the store, you know, back to a to a region, back to a customer, back to a dairy, back to a specific event, 
Um, that's that's ultimately what the consumer is investing in, and so it trickles down from you know buying decisions on products that have enforced our or enabled our users to create you know data points for animals for life. So basically, when the calf is born, they're tagged. Uh, if they're a registered herd, they get a registered n- uh, number uh, that's issued in a national database, and then that animal is then tracked for life uh, on basic events. Mm. And uh, and really looking at that on farm level, Ron, how common is it that animals are misidentified at birth? <laughs> you, you hate to actually say it, but it's it's very common. Um, people invest in in ID systems, and they they don't necessarily have a protocol or a system in place to go and monitor or to check uh, whether that system is operating at its you know performance that they think it should be. Um, simple tag management, um, making sure that animals have tags, making sure that you know tags haven't been you know replaced or fallen out or uh, you know ripped out by headlocks, for example, are are a key player in tag management. So I, I think all too often ID systems or, or tags on cows are, are not necessarily something that are checked relatively frequently. It's just one of those things that it gets done once and people tend to forget about it. Ah, okay. And let's speak into that a little bit more when we talk about those checkpoints along the lifespan of the animal and along the farm. What types of tags should be used for identification checkpoints as we go through the system from taking that cow into the milk or taking that calf into the milking system? Yeah, there's there's a wide range of, of different types of tags used for identification. Uh, here in the United States, we have a government issued tag uh, for national ID. Uh, it's a small ear button uh, that is an RFID tag. It can be used for, for identification in milking parlors, um, but just know that it is a smaller tag. It is lower cost, and obviously some of the results with that may also be you know lower than, say, a large neck tag that was actually designed for animal ID. So you just have to understand the environment that you're putting the tags into and you know what the results are that you want. So like I said, the national tag, it's very good for close range or hand wands or readers um, to, you know, see what's going on, you know, to see or to identify that animal up close. But to do it in, say, a rotary parlor or a, or a large parallel parlor, you know, the, the range for that ear to the antenna may be large. There might be other environmental factors causing that read range to be smaller and not as accurate of, of a read rate. So just things to keep in mind when when looking at tags to make sure that the tag is designed for the system and monitor those results. Uh, sometimes it's a good idea to create a protocol to to critique that system once a month. You know, go out and check. Uh, many systems out there will tell you if there's a few cows that are not IDing over and over and over, um, whether those cows are in the same pen or in multiple pens, take a look at them. You know, do they have tags? Did the tags fail? You know, is there something that changed recently to, in, you know, to induce the environment, causing the read range to decrease? So just simple protocols that can easily be put into place to verify and check that the ID is working. And Ron, what you just explained is in reference to the identification purpose of the tagging and monitoring system. But let's switch gears a little bit and speak to the data collection side. What are the checkpoints on the dairy where dairy producers should be collecting data? Correct. The the ID is basically the beginning. So once the ID is on the animal, then we can collect data from the cow, whether it's a milking parlor with milk meters and we want accurate stall information. So date and time and milk amounts that that cow is given, or in our case where we have a sensor on the neck uh, that monitors animals activity and uh, uh, basically your health monitoring throughout the day uh, remotely. So you can, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of sensors that you can, you know, wearable technology, we, we coined the phrase um, that a cow can have to record data points throughout her, throughout her life cycle of that day. 
Yeah. And so, uh, so there's all these uh, points where we can collect data. And again, you know, one of the integral pieces of data collection is being able to have systems set up as you had articulated there, Ron, to be able to actually read that data and that's coming from the tags. So go through a couple of scenarios. How close does a tag reader need to be to the cows to be able to accurately pull data? And you can walk us through maybe a couple examples from most dairy systems. For sure. I mentioned earlier about it, an ear tag that's a national tag uh, for an ID system. So that tag, uh, it's an 840 RFID tag. Basically, the read range on that tag can be anywhere from 10 to 20 inches uh, away from a panel antenna. So as the animal walks by the panel, uh, the tag would be energized and then the data would be sent over, you know, telling us what cow that is. Um, our wearable tags for data collection for activity and for health. Uh, those systems are are on a different frequency, so they're ultra high frequency systems, and basically we can read uh, basically the size of a football field. Uh, so if an animal is in a confined uh, freestall facility, uh, basically one antenna for the size of a football field to to just kind of get a visual. Wow. So so we are really talking about a wide range of of the ability for these readers to pick up that data. And let's let's go to the troubleshooting side. What can interfere with the ability for that reader to be able to transmit the data being collected into the system? Where are the the troubleshooting spots that can happen along the way? Yeah, great question. Uh, so if we're looking at an identification system, those tags are are using uh, a kilohertz frequency, um, that kilohertz frequency can be clouded by uh, environmental interference. And that interference can come from uh, most typically variable speed drives. Uh, so as dairies grow and, and their processes become larger, they use variable speed drives to save energy. Um, so think of a variable speed drive as your washing machine. So it doesn't sit there and spin at the same RPM continually. It speeds up, it slows down. Um, and when it does that, it's obviously throwing feedback onto the electrical network. Um, so things like uh, manure pumps, well pumps, um, even electrical lights uh, do some sort of a electrical feedback onto the grid that can cause interference with the read range of those tags. So, you know, if, if you do run into an issue, it's always good to ask what changed. You know, did something recently get added? Did you add a new washing machine? Did you add a new well pump? You know, did you replace some wiring? Um, there's a lot of practices that you can do to mitigate uh, that environmental impact um, when you're installing these uh, variable speed drives or, or variable frequency controllers. Um, the number one thing to do is to make sure that the drive is installed as close as possible to the motor. I know that's not always possible when you have a well that's, you know, maybe a few thousand feet from the barn and they always want the drive in the equipment room. So you now have you know, a few thousand feet of cable that you have to monitor and, and use. But there are things that you can do to mitigate that by doing an isolation transformer or, or things like that with the installation to help mitigate that. But so look for drives, look for lights, look for things that possibly have recently failed or been replaced uh, would be the things to do for troubleshooting. And what if you need some help with being able to do that troubleshooting and find solutions uh, on the dairy to be able to mitigate those risks of inaccuracy in the data transmission process? Where can our farmers find help for that? Uh, the first place to start is your local equipment dealer. Um, whoever you purchase the ID system from, they should be well versed in, in how equipment should be properly installed and, and routed. Uh, if they can pinpoint the source of, of the environmental noise, uh, then work with, you know, say if it's your equipment dealer that finds a well pump, then you can work with whoever installed your well pump. If it's the same dealer or a different dealer, work with them together and try and, you know, install it correctly to minimize that interference. Um, and if worst case scenario, you can also sometimes get the power company involved. Um, if it is something, you know, that's not even on your location, but coming in on the grid. Um, there have been some cases where, you know, the farm's at the end of the line and they're just, getting the power that the power company sends them and they really don't control what that is. So sometimes a power company is more than willing to step in and help out as well. 
Ah, that's a great, great tips and great advice there, Ron, on how to make sure that you have the resources available to be able to ca- calibrate that data with a high level of accuracy. And uh, speaking of accuracy, how can a dairy producer really assess that the data that they're bringing in through their identification, you know, through tags and, and different identifications and through these different checkpoints along the way that we've talked about, whether they were on a reader or in a parlor, um, how can a dairy producer really assess how accurate the data that they're collecting is? Yeah, I mentioned it briefly earlier, just basically in, incorporate a simple protocol you know, once a month, have one shift in the milking parlor, uh, monitor a couple strings and see if the cows in the stalls are the actual cows that are standing in the parlor. Um, that would basically verify if the ID system is working at its potential. Um, a lot of times, uh, dairies will do herd health with a wand reader. Um, so there they, they definitely want to know what cow that they're administering treatments to. Um, so that could, there's another way to protocol whether the tag is, you know, properly allocated to the right cow so hand readers are a fantastic tool um, most modern dairies with identification systems or sensors utilize them and then just the protocol in the parlor just to make sure the cow's in the right stall excellent well this has been a great conversation ron with some real life real world or real barn i should say tips that dairy producers can take home and use to really take a good hard look at the data they're collecting and be able to optimize it by making sure that it is as accurate as possible so that they have the power of the data in their hands to make those important decisions in their dairy farming businesses. Ron, thank you for joining us on the NEDAP Power Play. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Up Level Dairy Podcast. I'm your host, Peggy Coffeen. And if you like what you heard today, go ahead and head on over to upleveldairy.com to read the blog and join the Up Level Dairy email list so you can receive new podcasts, blogs, and special offers coming soon from Up Level Dairy straight in your inbox. To listen to more episodes, head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, and don't forget to rate and review. Connect with me, Peggy, at Peggy at UpLevelDairy.com and follow Up Level Dairy on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Mm-hmm.